Our session today. Uh, we welcome all of you. And obviously, you know, there's a good speaker we have with us, and you, some of you have already heard probably his talk last time, a few months ago. So he, he will be talking about the genetics aspect of the migrations of the Indians abroad, or out, of, out, of, out in the west or east, you know, all over. So he will be talking about that, and. Um, and he doesn't need any more introductions than we did last time, but he's a medical doctor, and uh, then he worked in the military until he retired. And then this is his, by his own interest and uh, drive actually, he started to get much more involved in the Indological aspects, the migrations of people you know, from outsides to India or India to outsides. And some of the work that he has done, and you have, you have already heard one of them in the last time, that it suggests very strongly that it's the Indians who migrated outside, not the outsiders migrated to India, which was the, uh, which was the accepted things by most of the historians even 30, 40 years ago. And uh, so uh, we'll... Uh, without much, you know, uh, taking any more time, I will just, you know, announce that uh, I think Maharaj is here now, Sarah Secretary Maharaj. The title of the talk, today's title of the talk is Genetic Identities of Indians and Their Past Migration to Distant Lands. And just uh, you know, without taking any more time, except one request, many of the audiences do not know much about genetics. And so they expressed, con they occasionally expressed concern. So I, if possible, that we will we'll ask the learned speaker to just explain a few terms, you know, like DNA, simple terms, DNA, and uh, these chromosomes, genes, and what is genetic code, and those things, just in a couple of minutes at the beginning, so that people would appreciate his talk much more uh, than otherwise. So uh, with that little you know, introductions, I'll just call that speaker on the stage. And uh, maybe there, please. As a token of appreciation, you know, for the, of the institute, we'll give a give a set of books published by the institute. I think most of them, not all of them. And so this is for you. Thank you. And it's very much. Stage is yours. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude to the Institute of Culture, Ramakrishna Mission, Gold Park, for giving me this opportunity to discuss about the pre-recorded past of India, that of Bengal, and also that of the world. I'm extremely grateful to the Secretary Maharaj Swami Supernanda Ji for giving me this opportunity. I need his blessings to take this subject forward at the global level. I am also grateful to Dr. S. K. Lahiri for organizing this, uh, this talk. This is the second time we are having a lecture on this subject at the same venue. I have been exploring Indian subcontinent for quite some time to collect ground evidences to arrange the pre-recorded period of India <coughs> and give it give, and I'm trying to present it in a uh, in a scientific manner as far as possible. It took me 20 years of collection of data from the ground evidence uh, from the ground 
to arrange the whole thing in the right sequence of the whole process. And eventually, I had to extend my field of exploration to distant lands. When I realized that in India, there are many regions which has a connectivity with the Red Sea region. I had to personally visit Egypt to collect ground evidences from there that we can't only think that it may be there. We have to see whether what is there exactly so that we can correlate it much better. I have recently authored a book titled India in Egypt. I have compiled information which has uh, given an, uh, an uh, I, I could realize that there was an intense connectivity between the Indian and the Egyptian civilization. In fact, evidences both at the Indian end and the Egyptian end confirmed that Egyptian civilization was actually established by the Indian origin people. You may have difficulty in accepting this view at this juncture because our history does not say it that way, neither the history of the world. But I think there is a lot of uh, gray areas in our history. Our history is not very authentically arranged. On the other hand, when we collect ground evidences, that gives us a much more authentic idea about the pre-recorded past of India. Interestingly, that new narrative becomes quite different from what we are taught in our history classes. It is high time that we made an effort to arrange the uh, uh, pre-recorded past of India on the basis of available evidences which has emerged in the last two or three decades, particularly in subjects like archaeology and genetics. In my previous lecture, in the month of February 2022, I had discussed how I approached this subject and how I have arranged my, the contents of my book, India in Egypt. It is actually based on available data about various subjects like archaeology, anthropology, culture, language, and of course, genetics. One of the gentlemen, he had a question that if my hypothesis is based on available genetic data, then uh, I should take another elaborate class on that subject so that uh, I can stress more on exactly what has, uh, what has come. I mean, what we know about, the, uh, about various study reports at this juncture about India and about the, uh, about the rest of the world. Obviously, if we manage to arrange the migration path uh, along a compatible genetic direction, it will be much more acceptable to the scientific community of the world. So that, that is an advantage. In fact, in that case, they would have difficulty in discarding it straight away. At least they will take it much more seriously. Here I am trying to arrange the available genetic data which suggests that a very early migration of Indian origin fraternities had taken place from India to the West. Uh, I must emphasize at this stage that all these genetic data have been generated, compiled, and published by the global scholars, often in consultation with the Indian scientists. What I am doing is I am arranging the same data in a more meaningful manner, in a, in a more rational and meaningful manner. Yes, my hypothesis is at this stage it has to be scrutinized by the global scholars to be accepted. Considering that many of you have not attended my previous lecture, uh, I would like to show you a small video to connect you with the, uh, with the contents of the book and the, and the actual contents of the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we had discussed about many new concepts. Uh, uh, which, which uh, uh, without thinking about these concepts, it is very difficult to understand that how the migration has taken place from this end to that end. Now, the concepts are we have to understand the process of 
Arrival of anatomically modern humans in India from Africa 65,000 years ago. I am talking about last out of Africa move. You know, after that, uh, we have to under, before that also, people had come to India, but they could not survive because of various scientific reasons. The, the team which had the out of Africa move, which took place about 65,000 years back, they have survived in India. We have to understand India served as the intermediate host. And since then, that is since 65,000 years, they have lived in India permanently. One has to understand the process of origin of newer genetic identities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups on the Bengal coast during the last glacial period. We have to extend our period into glacial period and interglacial period, at least two or three previous glacial periods. It is necessary to understand the significance of animal symbols seen both in India and abroad. This is a very, very interesting subject which we tend to uh, ignore uh, for, for whatever reason. Wherever we go, all over the world, we see some animal symbols. But unfortunately, no organized study has been made so far to arrange them in a regular manner. What does this Naga symbol, Motsu, Kurmo, elephant, lion, we see them all over. We, with, with, as Bahun with other, our, uh, our deities, as well as in almost every temple and archaeological structure. But for whatever reason, somehow we consider them as very, uh, uh, the symbol used by the primitive people. But we can see that everybody has used that right from Ashoka. Almost every royal family will have a seal where they will find animal symbols. So this is a very interesting subject which we don't give adequate importance. That is one of my favorite subjects. For almost 15, 20 years, I'm arranging thousands and thousands of this, I mean, analyzing thousands and thousands of these animal images to arrange them in an orderly manner, and both in India and abroad. Uh, we have to establish the trans Himalayan migration path pivoting Mount Kailash. We have a vague idea that trans Himalayan migration, but it has. I had to explore almost every river originating from Mount Kailash to understand that what, why I am saying that actually it, all these migration paths pivoted Mount Kailash. Then only everything falls into place. Uh, we have to understand the spread of matriarchal communities from India to Egypt and Europe with their language and culture. We have to understand that Indian origin fraternities established the Egyptian and Greek civilization. That was the main subject of my previous lecture. And finally, we have to arrange the evidences to establish the reverse migration of Indian origin fraternities by both land route and sea route. And we will see that reverse migration fraternities arrived from both Egypt and Europe. Let us watch the short video to recapitulate the contents of the book. But at this juncture, I would like to request you to go through the book. Uh, basically, there are a lot of maps, lot of subjects. Once you see the chapters, you will understand how I have approached this almost impossible subject. Uh, when I started writing, I was in a dilemma, is it possible to actually arrange the antiquity of Indian civilization in one book? Then I started arranging the chapters. Then I thought, Ki, OK, fine, I will, I will, in this book, I will deal with only Egypt. I won't uh, bring much of Europe unless it is absolutely required. But eventually, in genetics, Europe came into picture because majority of the Euro Egyptian genetic studies have been conducted involving the European population. Then I have to establish, ki, okay, fine, your, uh, your genetic identities are originating from here. So I had to take much of that here. Achha, then, uh, but unless you see the book, it will be like going on a global tour without seeing the uh, global map. You won't know how many continents are there. You won't know how the continents are placed. It will be like that. So kindly see this book. This is available in this library also, in the Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture Library. Uh, I will show you the video now. Uh, light off, Corinne, by the way. Actually, by the light off, it's hard. Yeah. 
Though in this is in short is the previous lecture with other ancient civilizations of the world, like the Sumerian, Mesopotamian, uh, Egyptian, and Greek civilizations. Repeat, 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 repeat. Though Indian civilization is discussed along with other ancient civilizations of the world, like the Sumerian, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, and Greek civilizations, it could be much older than the rest. Presently, the Indian civilization is considered 5,000 years old, and its origin is explained linked with the Indo-Aryan migration. Discovery of several newer archaeological sites suggests that this civilization is at least 10,000 years old. It is also possible that the Indian civilization played the role of a mother in the origin of other ancient civilizations. AMH or anatomically modern humans, scientifically known as Homo sapiens sapiens, originated in Africa about 2 lakh years ago. They arrived in India tentatively 65,000 years ago. The presence of a large number of dark complexion tribes in India suggests the continuous survival of AMH here. Though AMH reached Europe and Northern Asia during every interglacial period, they could not survive there during the severe weather of glacial maximum and became extinct. Present population has reached there from India during the last interglacial period 10,000 years ago. During glacial period, a huge coastal landmass surfaces between the Bengal and Myanmar coast. At this time, the population of two distinct genetic territories, the Bengal coast and Southeast Asia, intermix, producing newer genetic identities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroup in Y chromosome. As the seawater gradually rises during the interglacial period, this coastal landmass submerges, displacing the settled population. They settled on the Bengal coast and adopted various animal symbols as their ethnic identity. The Naga, Tiger, Lion, Elephant, Fish, Turtle, Avian, Primate, each animal symbol seen at various archaeological sites represented an Indian origin human fraternity. They eventually migrated following the trans Himalayan migration routes which bifurcated from Mount Koilash. About 10,000 years ago, R1 Bravo fraternity descended from Koilash and followed the Makran coast to reach Africa where the Egyptian civilization developed. The Indus Valley civilization emerged on this route. Similarly, about 5,800 years ago, R1 Alpha Fraternity migrated to Europe along with the spoken Sanskrit language. The migration path of the Bagh Fraternity can be traced from Bagdogra in North Bengal ascending along the Bagmati River and reaching the Baglunkali Temple in Nepal and finally Baghdad in Mesopotamia across Mount Kailash. A number of localities named after Bagh in Afghanistan like Baglan, Bagram. Baghdad is located on river Tigris, which also means Bagh in Bengali. Koch or the turtle fraternity migration path can be established from Bengal and Assam along river Jomuna of Bangladesh to reach Koilash. Incidentally, turtle is the Vahun of Jomuna, suggesting its migration along the river. As one descends along Indus from Koilash, one reaches Koch of Gujarat and Kachi district of Baluchistan. Following the Persian Gulf, one reaches the territory of Kassites in Mesopotamia and finally the Koch fraternity emerges as Kushites in the Horn of Africa. It is possible that the Caspian Sea and Caucasus Mountains were so named as they were Koch fraternity settlements. It is likely that a matriarchal culture evolved on the Bengal coast at a very early date. During this period, goddesses became popular. Kali is known as Adi Shokti or primordial energy. It is likely that goddesses like Kali, Durga, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Monosha, which are extremely popular in Bengal, emerged during a matriarchal period when women were considered as the depository of knowledge, wealth, and power. As the matriarchal community spread to Egypt, we find emergence of goddesses like Nut, Hathor, and Isis in Egypt. Lieutenant Wilford, a British officer, wrote an article in the Asiatic Researches in 1794 where he established that the Nile River was known as the Kali River and this is mentioned in the Padma Puran and Skanda Puran. Similarly, in Greece, Athena was very popular at the early stage of the establishment of the European civilization. Athens, the ancient city of Greece, derived its name from Athena, like Kolkata deriving its name from Kali. 
The Sphinx of Alexandria in Egypt guarding Pompeius Pillar Complex appeared to me very similar to Durga, who is inseparably associated with the lion. In fact, Lieutenant Wilford mentioned in his article that the Sphinx name originated from the word Singhi, meaning Singho-like or associated with lion. I was overjoyed to read that Sphinx was associated with the word Shingo. Shingo is a typical Bengali word meaning lion. I was equally thrilled when I went to the Phila temple in Aswan in Egypt. I found typical brachycephalic faces and slanting eyes of Isis created on the temple pillars, remarkably similar to the faces of the deities of Bengal. On top of almost every pillar, lotus images have been sculpted, when lotus is not a natural flower of Egypt. Moreover, Isis is shown with a yellow complexion, very similar to Lakshmi or Sri of Bengal. At the entrance of the Edfu temple, a large image of falcon is bound to attract the attention of Indians. This mythical eagle is the associate of Horus in Egypt. Our Hori or Vishnu also has a strikingly similar mythical eagle popularly known as Goru as his bound. I wonder if Hori has manifested as Horus in Egypt. Oshur manifesting as Osiris and Sri as Isis. Interestingly, like our Oshur, Osiris is also green complexioned, a rather unusual color of the skin. The relative position of Nut and Jeb, two early deities of the Egyptian pantheon, appeared to have a similarity with the composite image of Kali and Shiva of Bengal. Here, the deity Nut is placed over her concert Jeb, who lies on the ground like Shiva in Bengal. The names Jeb and Shib are phonetically quite similar. Moreover, Nut is studded with stars and one of the manifestations of Kali is Tara meaning stars. Kali is associated with the crematorium in India and Nut with the burial sites in Egypt. Interestingly, Nut and Jeb have two sons and two daughters very similar to Shiva and Durga of Bengal. In the second half of my book, I have discussed the evidences of reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities from Egypt by different routes in different periods. The land route reverse migration took place along the Uttarapod and the Indus Valley civilization. We find the emergence of the reverse migration animal symbols like the lion, horse, boar and peacock along the Uttarapod. They are found all over the subcontinent, especially in the Indian Himalayas, Nepal, Bhutan, Tibetan Plateau, Bengal and Northeast India. A number of evidences identify the onward and reverse migration routes. I have seen two owners of a shop in Pokhara, Nepal. One was shot with brachycephalic features, which is a typical feature of indigenous Indians. While the other was not only tall, but had oligocephalic face, which is a typical feature of some regions of Europe. I have also seen Kali in Kamala Shagar temple of Tripura draped in a white sari, suggesting her reverse migration nature. Over a period, the sea route reverse migration from the Red Sea region got established and extended to the Bay of Bengal as they were keen to reach the matriarchal territories of Gangariti. The Prakrita speaking fraternities returned back to Bengal at this stage. As the Bengali speaking reverse migration fraternities settled in Bangladesh, their Bengali dialects were different. I realized that the reverse migration fraternities had settled in the Northeast India since a very early period. During the land route migration period, they had come through Uttarapod along river Brahmaputra from Koilash. Many of them had settled in the higher reaches of the Himalayas like Monpas of Tawang, while some others descended to the Brahmaputra valley. The reverse migration fraternities from the Red Sea arrived later who settled in the region using two different routes. One fraternity from the Bay of Bengal ascended along the rivers of Bangladesh to settle in Assam and Tripura. Thus we find ancient Greek art, popularly known as Hellenistic art in the 6th century Dahaparvatiya temple of Tejpur. In Koilashahot Tripura, we find unusual huge rock cut images of Shiva in the Unakoti complex. The other group entered the Northeast Indian states from the east as they ascended along the river Iravati and Chinvi. The Ahoms reached along this route in the 13th century. The ancestral memorial of Ahoms in Charaidao are known as Maidems, which are miniature replica of the pyramids of Egypt. In fact, the oldest Egyptian pyramids were also known as Maidems. The Hebrew name of Egypt is Mirzaim. Mizos had been given visa by Israel as they were considered to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. 
One of the oldest Egyptian documents, Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, compiled at the beginning of the Christian era, mentions about the connectivity of the Red Sea and this region. There is a need to arrange the pre-recorded period of India based on available ground evidences. In that direction, I intend to start a discussion on several issues which need serious attention. Next slide. I had to arrange various migration paths from India to Egypt and Greece. These migration paths are not completely imaginary, but they are arranged as which they are compatible with the available genetic, archaeological, linguistic and cultural evidences and data discovered and known to the world. Out of this, today we are specifically going to concentrate on available genetic data to establish that early post-glacial period genetic identities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups originated on the Bengal coast and they migrated from Ganga Ridhi or ancient West Bengal to different directions. I shall present the topic under two heads. In part one, we will discuss genetic evidences suggesting the onward migration of the Indian origin fraternities to the west and in part two, Genetic evidences suggesting the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities back to India. Video. Genetic identities are transmitted both through maternal and paternal routes. Maternal genetic identities are known as mtDNA haplogroups which are transmitted from mother to both sons and daughters. On the other hand, the paternal genetic identities remain exclusively in the Y sex chromosome and transmitted from the father only to his son and not to his daughter. It is observed that R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome are two principal paternal genetic identities present in some parts of Eurasia and Northern African region. Tracing the presence of these two paternal genetic identities is essential to identify the direction of their spread in different parts of the world. It appears that these genetic identities originated during the last glacial period and their spread occurred during the last interglacial period starting from 12,000 years ago. Identification of the site of origin of the newer genetic identities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome is most crucial issue in order to understand the process of migration of the early human fraternities. These two newer genetic identities spread not only in the Eurasia region but R1 bravo haplogroup also spread to Africa. As I have discussed in my book titled India in Egypt, Several animal symbols were adopted by different ethnic fraternities as their ethnic identity. As they migrated from the east coast, they spread Indian languages to those distant lands. What was so special about the east coast of India where all these ethnic fraternities developed? Is it possible that newer AMH fraternities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome originated in this region? Unless we are able to establish the unique nature of the Bengal Myanmar coast to justify the origin of the newer genetic identities, the discussion regarding the migration of various ethnic fraternities from the east coast becomes baseless and so will be the case regarding the spread of Indian languages. Interestingly, R1 alpha haplogroup in Y chromosome genetic identity is found in the entire Indo-European language speaking territory extending from Eastern India to Western Europe. Thus, this entire territory is clearly linguistically and genetically continuous. Europe has high percentage of R1 Bravo haplogroup in Y chromosome genetic identity. This genetic identity is also found in various other regions of Asia including India and Mesopotamia and also in the Afro-Asian speaking Central Africa. Presently, it is believed that R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome both originated in Eastern Europe near the European Stipi and Anatolia region. Whereas, it appears that a unique geophysical phenomena which took place on the east coast of India during the last glacial period is responsible for the origin of these two newer genetic identities in that region. 
It is extremely crucial to establish the site of origin of R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome on the Bengal glacial coastal shelf during the last glacial period. That would provide us the direction of the migration of the post-glacial period anatomically modern human fraternities from east to west, which started 12,000 years ago. This would also justify the spread of Indian languages and culture to distant lands. A number of Aboriginal tribes lived in the Andaman archipelago. However, there is very little discussion about who were these people, when and how did they reach there. The only probable explanation is that they walked into the Andaman archipelago from the Bengal Myanmar coast when a land bridge formed. During the glacial maximum, the sea level subsides by about 400 feet or 130 meters and the Bengal coastline recedes connecting Andamans with the mainland. In the physical map of India, we find the Bay of Bengal region having a very shallow depth. During the last glacial period, for several thousand years, a huge coastal landmass surfaced between the Bengal and Myanmar coast, which is referred to as the Bengal Glacial Coastal Shelf in this book. During this time, the population of two distinct genetic territories, the east coast of India and Southeast Asia, intermixed. And this genetic union produced newer genetic identities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome. As the seawater gradually rose during the interglacial period, this coastal landmass submerged, displacing the settled population. They settled on the Bengal coast and adopted various animal symbols, as mentioned before, as their ethnic identity. To begin with, they were bare-bodied and were known as Naga, popularly known as Nanga in Hindi, who adopted the Naga or serpent as their ethnic symbol. It is possible that their mother goddess was Kali, who is also depicted bare-bodied. Some of these early fraternities eventually migrated following the trans himalayan migration routes devoting Mount Koilash. The Indus Valley civilization emerged on this route. They continued their journey and established the Egyptian and Greek civilizations. For this reason, we find R1 Bravo reaching Mediterranean coast, Afro-Asian speaking Africa and also in Western Europe. Now let us discuss the present view regarding the identification of the site of origin of R1 Bravo and R1 Alpha haplogroups. This is the present map available regarding the distribution of R1 Bravo haplogroup in the Y chromosome in the world. R1 Bravo haplogroup is found in Europe, Middle East, Northern Africa and in scattered form in Asia. It is observed that though the concentration of R1 Bravo is much more in Western Europe, European stipe, located in extreme Eastern Europe, is considered as its site of origin considering that older divisions of R1 Bravo are found in the East. But in spite of having several pockets of R1 Bravo farther East and on the Bengal coast, any Eastern location as the probable site of origin of R1 Bravo haplogroup is never considered. Interestingly, several pockets of RPH155, which is commonly known as R1 Bravo 1 Bravo, are found in isolated locations, for example in Bhutan, Ladakh, Xinjiang province of western China north of Ladakh, Yunnan province of southern China close to northeast India, Tajikistan, Turkey and Bahrain. Scholars admit that the presence of these pockets is difficult to explain if the origin of R1 Bravo haplogroup is considered to be the European stipe. Moreover, there is no linguistic continuity between European stipe and Afro-Asian speaking Africa where R1 Bravo is present. Thus, there are several unsolved puzzles which create obstacles to accept the European stipe as the site of origin of R1 Bravo haplogroup. Genetic studies involving European population had started a couple of decades ago. Hence, more genetic data of that region are now available. As other territories got included in the genetic studies, unusual R1 Bravo pockets emerged which further complicated the issue. 
Indian population have been included in the genetic studies comparatively recently. In the recent studies published by the global scholars, a few pockets of R1 Bravo have emerged in India which demands a serious attention. Interestingly, an isolated pocket of R1 Bravo genetic identity is found on the east coast of India, which has not received the required attention so far. Kivisil study conducted in 2003 shows that 6.5% population of West Bengal have R1 Bravo, which is quite significant. These isolated pockets need to be included while charting the early migration paths of the fraternity. In fact, it is even possible that this pocket is the oldest settlement of the R1 Bravo genetic identity from where earliest migration of R1 Bravo started. Once we arrange the migration path of R1 Bravo originating from the Bengal coast, all other pockets of R1 Bravo including the isolated pocket of Bahrain could be connected along the two continuous migration paths. Now let us discuss the present view regarding the origin of the R1 alpha haplogroup in Y chromosome which is exclusively found in the Indo-European speaking territory. Anderil and his team published a number of papers following their periodic studies on the subject. His map on the origin of R1 alpha also suggested that it originated in the Anatolia and European Stipe region. However, the map drawn on the basis of a recent study by the same team confirmed that a pocket of oldest R1 alpha haplogroup is found in Western India near Gujarat and two pockets of high concentration of R1 alpha zone are found in the Himalayan region. Many scholars thus feel that the site of origin of R1 alpha haplogroup in South Asia cannot be ruled out. Though in this map, Bengal is not shown as one of the important sites harboring R1 alpha in the region, almost all the studies including Underhill studies have confirmed that R1 alpha is found in significant number in West Bengal. In fact, as per the study by Sharma in 2009, 72% of the Brahmin population of West Bengal has R1 alpha haplogroup, one of the highest percentage of R1 alpha in the world. Moreover, Bengali language not only belongs to the Indo-European language branch, but it has a significant component of Sanskrit and Prakrito, two of the oldest languages of the group. It is much easier to detect a pocket of early genetic fraternities in a remote region where the population remained relatively undisturbed like in the Himalayan region and Gujarat. On the other hand, it is extremely difficult to locate a pocket of early R1 alpha in Bengal as this region received a number of reverse migration fraternities over millennia till a recent period from different directions. Thus, Bengal is expected to have the most complex form of genetic admixture posing a challenge for the geneticist to analyze its composition. It is interesting to observe that Bengal region not only has a linguistic continuity with Europe as Indo-European speakers, but it also has genetic continuity with Europe where R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome are primary genetic identities. It is likely that a very early migration of post-glacial period anatomically modern humans or AMH fraternities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome had taken place from India to the west with their language and culture. The distribution of the R1 bravo haplogroups detected all over the world has a striking similarity with the migration path of the R1 bravo haplogroup proposed in this book. They originated on the Bengal coastal shelf and migrated along the Himalayan rivers as their settlements submerged at the onset of the interglacial period. As they reached the junction at Mount Koilas, they followed two distinct routes. One route descended along river Indus and followed Makran coast to reach Central Africa entering the continent through the Horn of Africa. In this way, R1 Bravo haplogroup reached Bahrain on this path. The other route from Mount Koilas reached Europe through Anatolia or Turkey and European Stipe. This migration started 10,000 years ago or before at the onset of the interglacial period, more specifically during the meltwater pulse 1b of the interglacial period. Similarly, about 5,800 years ago, as the settlements of the R1 alpha submerged on the Bengal coast, during the meltwater pulse 1c of the interglacial period, 
another wave of migration started. They also followed the Himalayan rivers from Bengal coast to reach Mount Kailash and divided into two branches. One branch descended along the Indus to Gujarat and Baluchistan, where an old division of R1 alpha was detected by the Underhill genetic study team. The other branch from Mount Kailash reached Eastern Europe, entering the continent through Anatolia and European steppe. Thus, we find another old division of R1 alpha detected by the Underhill team in that region. According to a 2014 study by Underhill, R1 alpha M417 divided into two lineages Z93 and Z282 about 5800 years ago. Z93 is more common in Indian subcontinent while Z282 is in Europe. This suggests that these two lineages dissociated 5800 years ago when R1 alpha spread from India to Eastern Europe across the Himalayas and these two lineages flourished in their respective territories. Both the R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups from India entered Europe through the European steppe and Anatolia or modern day Turkey and hence this region possesses oldest division of both these genetic identities found within Europe. This region thus erroneously appears to be the site of origin of both these genetic identities. 10,000 years ago, R1 Bravo spread to Mediterranean coast, Egypt and Africa with Pali and Prakrito languages. On the other hand, 5,800 years ago, R1 Alpha spread to Eastern Europe with spoken Sanskrit language. It is important that we understand that both R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome originated on the east coast of India and from there they spread along with their language and cultural characteristics. Only then the archaeological, linguistic and cultural elements of India found all over Eurasia and Africa, especially in Egypt, would be much easier to appreciate. The Egyptian civilization, one of the oldest civilizations which emerged in Africa, was possibly developed by the people who had come from India with their language and culture. In fact, as we arrange the migration path of early genetic identities originating from India, a very interesting observation emerges. All the ancient civilizations like the Indus Valley Civilization, Sumerian, Mesopotamian, Egyptian and Greek civilization can be found along the two migration paths originating from India. European territory can be compared with a jar with its opening towards the European steppe and Anatolia on the east. During the last interglacial period, Newer genetic identities like the R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups entered Europe through this end, starting from 8000 years ago. During this time, agriculture also entered Europe through Anatolia or modern day Turkey. The Proto-Indo-European language possibly entered Europe around 5800 years ago along with the R1 alpha haplogroup in the Y chromosome. On the purely genetic front, it appears that the R1 Bravo haplogroup in Y chromosome reached Europe around 8000 years ago. They reached in good number as the trans Himalayan migration path pivoting Mount Koilash opened. At a later date, around 5800 years ago, R1 Alpha haplogroup arrived in Europe along with their spoken Sanskrit language. As they reached Europe from the east, they pushed the R1 Bravo haplogroup in Y chromosome more towards the west. So today we find R1 Bravo concentration more towards Western Europe as this R1 Bravo distribution map suggests. However, interestingly, it has been found that older branches of R1 Bravo haplogroups are found towards the east near the European steppe as they had entered through Europe through this route. On the other hand, as the R1 alpha haplogroup arrived later from the east, we find their concentration more towards Eastern Europe as these R1 alpha distribution map portrays R1 alpha haplogroup in Y chromosome also introduced spoken Sanskrit which served as the Proto-Indo-European language. The phenomena of the reverse migration of these Indian origin fraternities back to India is now referred to as the Indo-Aryan invasion. It appears that the R1 Bravo haplogroup spread from India during the first wave of migration which reached Mediterranean coast, Egypt and Afro-Asian speaking Africa. 
From these regions, I found another interesting axis along which R1 Bravo haplogroup reached Western Europe directly across the Mediterranean Sea. Along with them, Indian language and culture must have reached Western Europe pretty early. We find a territory called Bas in France and Spain with a different culture and language. Interestingly, Basque language does not belong to the Indo-European branch and hence it is considered as one of the lingua isolate. Obviously, this culture and language must have arrived here much before the European culture and Indo-European language reached this region. Archaeologically also, we find spread of bell beaker culture along this route reaching Western Europe which lasted from 2800 BC to 1800 BC. Coincidentally, as the Indian origin people started migrating from this region back to India, this form of art disappeared from Europe. Curiously, this reverse migration phenomena coincides with the collapse of several ancient civilizations of the world. The Indian origin people approached Europe from two directions. One group entered via Turkey and European steppe while the other directly reached Western Europe across the Mediterranean Sea. As a result, we find different pockets of bell beaker culture in Europe. Moreover, as it was carried by the Indian origin people, this culture was found associated with both R1 Bravo and R1 Alpha haplogroups, but more with the first. Intriguingly, the shape of this bell beaker is still quite popular among the artisans of India. At this juncture, there is a definite need to search for the source from where these R1 Bravo and R1 Alpha haplogroups in Y chromosome were spreading with their refined languages and advanced skills. This search is likely to lead you to the east coast of India. It is high time that we acknowledge that there was a refined civilization existing beyond Europe on its east since a very early period and possibly since the last glacial period. Interestingly, a number of archaeological sites have been discovered recently beyond Europe on the east which suggests the direction of arrival of the fraternities with advanced knowledge and skill. The location of Gobekli Tepe and Jericho in southeast Turkey and around suggests their arrival from the east. These sites were created 12,000 years ago. The structure found there suggests that they were created by a refined fraternity and not by the primitive hunter-gatherers. It is time that we extended our vision farther east in search of the source of such advanced skill and knowledge. Recent discovery of large archaeological sites at the Gulf of Kambat Cultural Complex, Mergar, Rakigari, Virana, Kalibangan and so on establishes the route as they are all located on the migration path from eastern India to the Mediterranean coast as suggested in this book. These settlements have all been detected to have existed since around 10,000 years ago. They are clearly much older than whatever has been discovered in entire Europe so far. It appears that a refined civilization had developed on the east coast of India during the last glacial period. It is possible that organized cities like Atlantis described in the Greek literature submerged on the Bay of Bengal. They were compelled to migrate along with their language and culture as their coastal settlements submerged since the onset of the interglacial period 12,000 years ago. These migrating fraternities established civilizations on the Mediterranean coast, Egypt and Europe. Gulf of Kambat cultural complex has been discovered on this route from east coast of India to the Mediterranean coast region. There is a need to conduct marine archaeological explorations to find an ancient submerged civilization on the Bengal coast. It is likely that the Indian origin people remained in touch with India. At a later date, they returned to India due to different reasons and this happened over a long period of time. This process is referred to as the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities in this book. This sequence of events are almost unbelievable to accept at this stage because they have never been discussed and explained in this manner in our academic syllabus. Fortunately for me, there are enough ground evidences to help me to explain this actual process to you. 
authentic ground evidences have never been taken into consideration while writing our history. I would like to highlight a few issues which are important to suggest that a reverse migration of Indian origin fraternities had taken place from the Red Sea region and especially from Egypt. First, we find reverse migration animal symbols like lion, horse, boar and peacock appearing in our archaeological sites and monuments. I consider them as animal symbols introduced in India by the reverse migration fraternities. Lion and horse were not Indian origin animal species and thus it could be considered that they were adopted by Indian origin fraternities but outside India. Second, we find there were 16 Mahajanapadas. Interestingly, this is very well rec recorded in text. They are described in the Pali text of Buddhism and Jainism. And Buddha frequently visited these places. Obviously, they were settlements of Pali speaking fraternities. Ashoka, next slide. Ashoka, whose territory spread all over the country, wrote his messages in Pali language. Why? Simply because majority of the Indians were Pali speaking speakers during the 3rd century BC. It is easy to identify who were the Sanskrit speakers. I have discussed spoken Sanskrit went to your Eastern Europe with our one Alpha Hafta group from India. The process of reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities from there is now known as Indarian invasion. Pali died its natural death under pressure. But the question remains, who were these Pali speakers? If the Sanskrit speakers were the reverse migration fraternities from Europe, Pali and Prakrita speakers were the reverse migration fraternities from the Red Sea region including Palestine, now Palestine, Egypt and Greece. Prakrita language is found at dissociated places. This is Marathi Prakrita, Saurashini Prakrita, Magadhi Prakrita and Vishnupriya Manipuri language of Manipur which is also similar to Prakrita. Even Bengali language has got very strong influence of Prakrita. Now have we ever given a thought that why Prakrita is found in dissociated places like this and so distant from one another? That is because the reverse migration fraternities, these are the settlements of the Prakrita speaking reverse migration fraternities and that is why these pockets have come up along the reverse migration path. It is essential to appreciate that there were various indigenous and reverse migration fraternities in India. There were fraternities who formed the majority of Indian population before the reverse migration Sanskrit speakers arrived. It is necessary to identify the territories occupied by indigenous Indians. They used to practice a pre-reverse migration culture of a pre-Aryan matriarchal culture. Pre-reverse migration culture or a pre-Aryan matriarchal culture. Unless we understand these various ethnic divisions of Indian population, it would be hard to comprehend the genetic divisions that have emerged. If, you conti if we continue to consider Sanskrit as the only authentic source, we will miss noticing the composition and contribution of these indigenous pre-Aryan fraternities of India and also the contribution of the reverse migration from the Red Sea region. Now we have to identify the regions that is indigenous matriarchal pre-Aryan culture territory. This is the place where the original, I mean the newer genetic identity is formed. Then indigenous pre and early post-glacial period population territory, Austroasiatic speakers, indigenous Dravidian culture speaker and finally reverse migration from Red Sea region territory. These are the Pali and Prakita speakers and reverse migration from European territory, they were the Sanskrit, they were reverse migration Sanskrit speakers. Now I would like to show you a structure which establishes the authority of the matriarchal community in ancient India. Let me discuss about a marvelous archaeological monument of India, Koilas Temple of Elora. Goddess Ganga and Jomuna here is guarding the main entrance. The, sanct next, the sanctum sanctorum is guarded by Lakshmi. Next, one of the main altar is dedicated to Goddess Saraswati, Ganga and Jomuna. And next, Durga 
is shown as destroying Asura there. This is just like our Mohishasur Mordini image. Does it establish that Koilas was protected by the matriarchal communities at one time? Does this magnificent structure display immense architectural capability of the matriarchal or matriarchal decent fraternities? If neutrally evaluated, these immaculate monolithic temples should be declared as the most complex man-made structure of the world. This structure I find is quite comparable to the gorgeous structures created in Egypt during the matriarchal rule there. We do not find any written record about this temple. Sanskrit texts would declare Koilas only as the abode of Shiva. Koilas temple is otherwise considered as the depiction of events taking place at the Koilas mountain region. Which one is then more authentic? The indestructible murals of the temple or the Sanskrit notes? It is important that we give due recognition to these ground features that can be seen by everyone as authentic information. There are only few non-Sanskrit source of information or evidence like the Pali records, these temple murals and folk arts. I can go on and on giving you examples. They form a major part of my book India in Egypt where I, where I analyze the ground evidence which are all around us and all over the country but unfortunately they do not form a part of our history. Now let me show you my video, how the genetic evidence also compels us to think about the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities back to India. However, once again to explain that I have to introduce new concepts like India has two distinct territories, pre and post glacial period population live in two distinct territories of India. That is reflected in the two distinct genetic divisions of Indian population. North India is suitable for human habitation only during the interglacial period. This has resulted in emergence of Mohajanapadas in the temporary settlement zone of North India. Video. Now let us see the video of the reverse migration. What has emerged so far? It would have been much easier to arrange the migration paths of the early fraternities had the event stopped here. But to complicate the issue, the Indian origin fraternities preferred to return to India which is referred to in this book as the process of reverse migration. They came back for various reasons, a conflict between the matriarchal and patriarchal fraternities initiating the process. As Christianity and Islam emerged in the Middle East, followers of Hinduism returned to their homeland because of religious persecution. Settlement of various reverse migration fraternities from different regions resulted in an admixture of genetic identities in different corners of India. Thus today, India has a very complex genetic composition of onward and reverse migration fraternities. It is extremely important that we understand the embryological process and manage to arrange the entire sequence of events of the migration of the various genetic identities during different periods. Otherwise, it would remain impossible for us to understand the complex findings of every genetic study conducted involving the Indian population. At this juncture, we have to consider that AMH or anatomically modern humans scientifically known as Homo sapiens originated in Africa about 200,000 years or 2 lakh years ago. They arrived in India about 65,000 years ago following their out of Africa move. They possibly followed a southern route known as the Great Coastal Migration. Though there are many theories regarding the early migration of AMH, this is the most accepted view. In all probability, anatomically modern humans reached Andamans from the Bengal Myanmar coast. They continued their eastward journey farther all the way to Australia. It is possible that India served as the intermediate host of anatomically modern humans and our ancestors continuously lived in India for 65,000 years. They reached Europe much later, about 45 to 50,000 years ago possibly from India during an interglacial period. 
Anatomically modern humans could survive in India during both the glacial and interglacial periods because of availability of favorable terrains. During the glacial period they lived in south of Vindhya Parbat, the green territory in the map, in eastern, central and southern India, while during the interglacial period they also spread to northern and western India, the blue territory in the map. The presence of a large number of dark complexion tribes in India suggests the continuous survival of anatomically modern humans here. Absence of any such human diversity in Europe and rest of Asia suggests the spread of anatomically modern humans in these regions only during the interglacial periods. Though AMH reached Europe and Northern Asia during every interglacial period, they could not survive there due to severe weather of glacial maximum and became extinct. We have evidences of extinction of Neanderthals in Europe and Denosovians in Siberia 40,000 years ago during a previous glacial maximum. It is possible that Indian origin people spread to other regions of Asia and Europe during the interglacial period once the trans himalayanization was possible. Let us try to understand what has emerged at the Indian end following a number of genetic studies involving Indian population. A very interesting genetic finding regarding Indian population has emerged in the recent times which needs a serious consideration. Indian population north of Vindhya Parbat has been found to have a genetic composition which is completely different from that of the population settled in the south of it. This has been claimed by a group of geneticists following a widespread study and has been published in a reputed scientific journal. This is rather unusual considering that this mountain range extending from east to west in central India has an insignificant height. This was in no way a barrier to restrict the movement of the population from north to south or from south to north. The genetic division of the people living north of India Parbat has been termed as Ancestral North Indian or A9 and those living on the south of the range as Ancestral South Indian or ASI in a recently published scientific paper. It is not understood how the genetic identity of Andaman Aboriginal tribes matches with the ASI genetic identity when this region never got physically connected with the Andaman archipelago. The anthropological fraternities living north and south of the Vindhya Parbat are distinctly different. It compels us to consider the origin of the pre and post glacial period genetic identities during the glacial period on the Bengal Myanmar coast. Presently, it is said that the ancestral North Indian population have a genetic identity which primarily matches with the genetic identity of Western and Central Asia and Europe. In fact, because of this finding, it is believed that North Indians have a close connectivity with these regions and they might have come from there. Incidentally, this line of thinking matches with the concept of Indo-Aryan invasion from the West to India. However, as per the Indo-Aryan invasion hypothesis, only a small number of people had come from the west referred to as Aryans. Majority of the existing population were indigenous. In all probability, the Aryan invaders were at the most 5-7% to of the total North Indian population. This small number of invaders could not have completely altered the genetic composition of the entire North Indian population as majority of them were indigenous. Moreover, indigenous people were placed at the bottom of the caste system like Shudra while the Indo-Aryans occupied the higher status like Brahmins and Khotriyos. This handful of higher caste people determined the rules of the society keeping every such rule blatantly tilting in their favor, which can be seen even now. In fact, social division of the caste system was so rigid that intercaste marriage was not accepted. Thus, it is not rational to consider the flow of genetic identity from higher caste to lower caste population. Finally, the geneticists have confirmed that lower caste and higher caste population essentially have been detected to have similar genetic identities 
except minor alterations. This confirms that the indigenous lower caste people and reverse migration higher caste fraternities had the same origin. It also confirms that the higher caste people or the Indo-Aryans are the reverse migration Indian fraternities from the West and thus they have similar genetic identities. It appears that indigenous R1 alpha haplogroup people travelled to Europe 5800 years ago. They were dark complexion who settled in Europe. In all probability, Kali was their mother goddess who with time manifested there as Black Madonna. These Indian origin fraternities started returning from Europe since 4000 years ago. This phenomena is now referred to as the Indo-Aryan migration. They established themselves as the higher caste Brahmins and Khotriyas in the caste system. If Indo-Aryans or higher caste people had originated and come from the West, they would have brought a new genetic identity to India. That did not happen. Both lower and higher caste people were found to have similar genetic identity. The reverse migration fraternities from Europe who occupied the highest status in the caste system as Brahmins and Khotriyas designated the reverse migration fraternities from Egypt as intermediate caste. They were referred to as Vaishos and were placed between the higher caste Brahmin and Khotriyas and lower caste Sudros. The observation of two distinct genetic divisions in the north and south of India Parbat needs a scientific explanation. Unfortunately, this genetic finding disclosed in scientific journals about a decade ago has not received adequate global attention which it should have received. It can only be explained by the origin of the pre- and post-glacial period genetic identities during the glacial period on the Bengal-Myanmar coast. The origin of the post-glacial period newer genetic identities like the R1 Alpha and R1 Bravo on the Bengal glacial coastal shelf explains this phenomena. This resulted in the occupation of the pre-glacial period genetic identities south of the Vindhya Parbat and post-glacial period genetic identities north of the Vindhya Parbat. It appears that ancestral North Indian territory demarcated by the geneticist corresponds with the post-glacial period settlement area and the ancestral South Indian territory corresponds with the pre-glacial period settlement area. We also have to understand what happened in northern India during the last glacial period. We have to delve deeper into the behavioral changes of the rivers of the entire northern India to understand the phenomena. Only then we would be able to fathom why only the territory north of Vindhya Parvat exhibits post-glacial period genetic identities. In other words, why did the post-glacial period people essentially settle in northern India? It is important to appreciate that the entire northern India is the catchment area of a number of rivers fed by the snow-melted glacial waters of the Himalayas. During the last glacial period, there was no melting of Himalayan snow and thus the rivers of the region became completely dry. Glacial period tentatively lasted for about 10,000 years when the Himalayan region got totally covered with frozen snow. During this period, northern India became unsuitable for human habitation and the area became devoid of human settlements. During the interglacial period, as the Himalayan snow started melting because of the rise in the global temperature, the rivers started flowing again making the region fertile and suitable for human habitation. For this reason, only during the interglacial period like the present period, northern India becomes suitable for human settlements. Hence, post-glacial period populations settle in this region. Northern India, including the Himalayan region, is thus referred to as the Temporary Settlement Zone of India or TSZI in this book. This is marked as the blue zone in the map. Incidentally, there are references in our ancient texts where it is mentioned that the river Ganga descended from Koilas Mountains to the Bay of Bengal. On the other hand, the area south of the Vindhya Parbat is scattered with rivers which do not originate from the Himalayas. They flow even during the glacial period when the rivers of the Himalayas get dried up. Thus, human settlement continues in this region of India during both the glacial and the interglacial periods. This region south of the Vindhya is thus referred to as the permanent settlement zone of India 
or PSZI. This region serves as the settlement of the pre-glacial as well as the post-glacial period population of India. This zone is marked as green territory in the map. The onset of the last interglacial period caused melting of the snow in the north and south poles resulting in a worldwide rise of seawater. These rise of seawater caused displacement of the fraternities settled on the Bengal glacial coastal shelf forcing them to migrate towards the mainland. They settled on the permanent settlement zone of the Bengal coast and also on the vacant areas of the temporary settlement zone in northern India. Finally, many of them migrated along the rivers of the Himalayas to distant lands like the Mediterranean coast, Egypt and Europe. Thus, the post-glacial period genetic identity R1 alpha haplogroup in the Y chromosome essentially settled in northern India. This region eventually accommodated both the onward migration and the reverse migration post-glacial period genetic identities. As the reverse migration fraternities returned from Western and Central Asia and Europe, North Indian genetic composition today shows similarity with these distant regions. This genetic composition has been identified as the ancestral North Indian genetic division by the geneticist in a recent study. The Gangetic Plains once again became fertile as the Himalayan rivers started flowing due to melting of snow at the onset of the interglacial period. It is extremely interesting to note that the reverse migration fraternities established majority of the Mahajanapadas in this fertile but vacant land north of the Vindhya Parbat. This fertile land was still available for settlement as the pre-glacial period fraternities were hunter-gatherers and they remained settled in the permanent settlement zone south of the Vindhyas. Similarly, both onward and reverse migration fraternities settled in the vacant lands along the Uttara path which served as the principal highway of the trans Himalayan migration. This region extended from Afghanistan in the west to the Tibetan plateau and Southeast Asia in the east. Two of the Mahajanapadas namely Cambodia and Gandhara emerged on the west of this region. On the other hand, pre-glacial period genetic fraternities settled south of the Vindhya Parbat have a completely different genetic identity and this is identified as the ancestral South Indian genetic division by the geneticists. As the land bridge between the Bengal Myanmar coast and the Andaman archipelago formed during the glacial period, only pre-glacial period population could enter the archipelago. Thus, Andaman population is found to have more similarity with the ancestral South Indian genetic division. There is one more important issue which needs to be settled regarding the site of origin of the newer genetic identities like the R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in the Y chromosome. It has been estimated that these genetic identities originated around 25,000 years ago. We find archaeological sites of Europe are only 9,000 years old. If we stick to the present view that these newer genetic identities originated in the European Stipe and Anatolia, then it becomes difficult to explain this period gap where they took 16,000 years to reach rest of Europe from European Stipe. Moreover, archaeological sites of Gobekli Tepe and Natufian culture have emerged in the meantime, which are 12 to 14,000 years old and are located in the southeast Turkey and on the Mediterranean coast much to the east of Europe. In this case also, they took 10,000 years to reach eastern Mediterranean coast from their site of origin in the European Stipe. Thus, these recent findings do not match with the period of origin of the newer genetic identities and their direction of movement. On the other hand, it is possible that these newer genetic identities originated on the Bengal coast during the last glacial period when the coastal landmass emerged around 25,000 years ago. They migrated only when their settlement started submerging around 12 to 14,000 years ago at the onset of the interglacial period. On their way to the Mediterranean coast and Europe, they established Gulf of Kambat cultural complex, Mehrgar, Natufian culture, Gobekli Tepe and settled in similar other ancient sites. 
Thereafter, they reached Anatolia and European steppe to enter Europe. If we consider this view, then the present genetic observations and archaeological findings match in a more acceptable manner. We have to keep in mind that India is a unique territory in many ways. It has territories where anatomical modern humans survived both during the glacial and interglacial periods. One needs to appreciate the unique nature of the Bengal coast where newer genetic identities like R1 Alpha and R1 Bravo originated. One also has to understand that Northern India remains suitable for human settlement only during the interglacial period. This resulted in pre- and post-glacial genetic identities settled in two halves of India. Majority of the scholars believe that anatomically modern humans reached India 65,000 years ago following their out-of-Africa move and great coastal migration. India served as the intermediate host where anatomical modern humans lived continuously for this entire period. During every interglacial period, the anatomically modern humans spread to the rest of Eurasia but they got extinct during the subsequent glacial maximum. Present population reached Eurasia during the last interglacial period when newer genetic identities like R1 Alpha and R1 Bravo spread there from India in the last 10,000 years. India needs a special attention of the global scholars to understand the process of early migration of anatomically modern humans all over the major parts of the world. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Pardon? Questions? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, we're kind of late though. Maybe one or two questions and now we can entertain because uh, people have to leave, the staff has to leave. Uh, first, okay, please. Ask. See, before. Hello. 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 Yeah. See, before, any, before I put any question, let me put in my background. See, I have just finished 18 years research on the story of Bharat since the arrival of ancient African man, which happened 1,18,000 years back, right? And uh, I was, I uh, told him too, my suggestion is that, you know, I didn't attend that February program of yours. I found plenty of loopholes and statements filled with it is likely, it is likely and ifs. You know, a researcher should put in a definitive statement which is very important. One thing which I have learned because of my research. Two, I would uh, seriously urge a third program which I will again come and attend, wherein you allow people to question at points. You know, I mean, if I were to go back and start questioning, it will start from your first yeah, slide itself. See, you will never, I mean, it's, it's a long process, I can understand, but you have to understand one very basic thing. I am discussing the contents of a book. I cannot discuss more than one percent which is there in the book. Now, if you want me to elaborate what points actually I have elaborated in the week, I have to skip almost everything and give I'm covering 65,000 I understand what you are saying that it, it is not sacrosanct that everybody who had come one lakh 18,000 years back has survived I've not finished we we have to think that who has survived the survival yeah, is 65,000 as per the majority of the scholars number one Number two is, I have elaborated every point in the book. You have to first go through the book and then you come back that you have written this in the book, firstly. And then you have to keep another thing in mind. For the first time, we are trying to explain the whole process. That is, what has happened in 65,000 years and what has happened in India, Egypt, Europe. 
a person this is this is you can say that i am trying to give a concept which is a holistic concept which i do not know whether ever it has been attempted if you feel that why it is not absolutely perfect i don't think that that is not practically possible i am trying to start a discussion in that line ki we can think in this manner because majority of the scientific data like the genetic evidences are suggesting in that line now we have to start the discussion now as you are expecting that in this uh, th there will, there will be complete description of exactly how i have arranged is practically not possible to reduce the book into 145 minutes or 20 30 minutes presentation i hope you will understand this yeah no but see my point was i mean i can't put in any question today I can't put in any question today because I would have started from your first slide, and you didn't ask me. You didn't allow the audience to raise the question at the at that point itself. See, that is, then, so, then, then we will never, never end up presentation if we ask anybody having any question every minute. Nee, nee, you have I mean, to understand. See, nee, nee, and I, I didn't suggest that. See what I do. See, I do. I take lectures on my subject, and my lectures are four to six and half hours long. That's and right. we always have a rule that if a, a person has a has an issue with an with an important concept explained, if, if, if people should me. If they permit me, I will ask everybody every minute. Do you have any question? Do you have any question? Then you know how many hours this picture may, can may go on. May I suggest on. something? You can talk to him probably, you know, outside because if there's one more question, it will be entertaining. Because the, the staff has to leave actually. They leave. I'm sorry about that. It's interesting questions you raised. doctor you have uh, talked about uh, onward migration of, of ancient indians to the west what about onward uh, migration of ancient indians to the east see again if you uh, permit me my presentation was aimed what was the connectivity between yeah. india and egypt actually the book if we again include the global phenomena who went from where to where in every direction and over the entire period then it is it becomes unmanageable in a single book so what i concentrated is can we really establish a connectivity a cultural connectivity a gen which is uh, compatible you know we are trying to include many subjects it has to be compatible with the archaeological finding genetic finding linguistic finding cultural finding i have concentrated india egypt connectivity but as i mentioned in this particular case that is when we are discussing genetics then europe invariably comes into picture because the post glacial period genetic identities are primarily r1 alpha and r1 bravo that went to northern europe afro asian speaking uh, africa but majority of it went to europe so yeah. if you ask me ki why you are not covering north america south america southeast asia uh, eastern asia see they who has gone to eastwards are actually reverse migration fraternity again it is very complex that what we are saying ki we went to egypt first it is not that ki we did not go like if you have noticed in r1 bravo i have shown from ladakh from bhutan one branch went to the east yunnan and then farther east towards uh, southeast asia but in this case i tried to avoid elaborating much on that and then comes the major population of southeast asia are actually reverse migration fraternity who are coming back from red sea region you know we find so much of indian culture in southeast asia we have to explain that but i can't discuss that in one uh, uh, book oblique in one lecture that who why are we having so much of indian culture in southeast asia that's a big subject by itself so of course they went of course they went but to process the to explain the whole process becomes quite complex in one lecture thank okay. you very much i i think you know it was a you know, wonderful talk and uh, so you can all you know discuss a little bit more probably when you go downstairs because the staff has to leave and they came in the morning early morning 
We are already late, so if you excuse us, the 